the season finale, the first season finale of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. I'm your host, Alex. Today is Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. I just want to thank you. If you stuck around for the whole first season, um, I, I think this is a, a natural ending. And I, I just so happened that it's uh, numbered 30. So um, 30 episodes deep feels good. Just a quick review of where we've been, what we've done. I started, I started this project as a way of improving my social skills, my speaking skills, public speaking. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking to anybody here. Not yet. I haven't had uh, the privilege of interviewing somebody on the podcast, though. That's not far off. I'm putting things into play, organizing and arranging things. So this first season, um, the entire thing was, was, I mean, this is, will always be a work in progress. That's what life is. It's a work in progress until you get knocked off and then you can't work anymore. (laughs) But the goal is to work. The goal is to continue progressing, continue getting better, continue innovating, not progress for the sake of progress. Progress for the sake of improvement, for the sake of innovation, for the sake of being better. Always. So if you stuck around from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for sharing that corporate love with your mans out here. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed to share it with somebody else. I don't know why you'd be ashamed. I suppose if you're stuck in corporate um, willingly, if you are willfully blind to working inside of corporate, you choose not to be a corporate cowboy. You choose to settle for how you're treated for any number of reasons that we've covered. Because I have a family. Because I have kids to feed. Because I'm a little fucking bitch. (laughs) Yo, bro, like, yo, fam. And that could be guys, gals. I'm not judging you. I can't judge you. I'm not one to judge, right? Just know that if a corporate cowboy should ever cross your path, it's not you. It's not you. Who comes upon them. It's the corporate cowboy. Essentially who comes upon you. Because you've settled. You've settled. You've you've picked the place in fucking corporate. And you chose to settle down. And corporate cowboys are on their way. In and out. So. um, Don't. Don't think you're. You're something special. Just because you, you become a fixture. Instead of an organization. Because you're not. The next season. Season 2. Of the Corporate Cowboy Podcast. Of the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. Um, It's right around the corner. Honestly. I don't have a whole lot of production. Um, I don't have any, anything extravagant planned, just what I previously had mentioned that is potentially interviews, um, going to continue keeping the episodes somewhat concise, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes max. And I think those would be good little sound bites instead of how I originally started uh, this project, I would take time. I'd have to schedule myself some time to to fill an entire hour with ramblings and corporate catharsis. 
and it wasn't smart. It wasn't smart. I mean, I found myself um, reeling after those hour episodes, just, you know, wanting to continue if I was in deep, just wanting to continue and um, not wanting to let up. So I, I think it went a little beyond just corporate catharsis, just the cathartic emotion and, um, and, and was more, um, not, not inspiring. It was, it was, uh, that wasn't even draining. It was emotionally charging, not charged. It was emotionally charged, but it was emotionally charging taxing in a sense because i still have other work to do i can't get off of a i don't want to get off of a podcast hyped up about putting in some work and then i gotta shake hands with a square with a with somebody's grandmother and be be a nice guy be a fucking be a fucking doormat <laughs> But I suppose that adaptability between being a fucking killer and playing the role of a doormat can come in handy. Some folks call it urban camouflage. And some folks are my associates. (laughs) It's me. I'm folks. So I'll continue improving um, the quality of of the podcast. The theme still will remain professionalism. <clears throat> what is a corporate cowboy? How to employ logic and tact inside of organizations, formal or informal organizations. Pretty much any organization that has a hierarchy is uh, liable to some kind of structure. It's liable to some kind of structural um, analysis, structural audit, a structural breakdown, some kind of strategy. They're liable to some kind of strategy from insiders and outsiders because a corporate cowboy is is fluent inside and outside of corporate <laughs> do you want to uh catch these episodes i think i'm going to um publish them on patreon and that's just gonna be the first season the first season i think i'm going to treat as um the lost tapes because there's a whole lot of there's a lot of information some some gems some um some maybe even more revealing that i would like than i would like (laughs) And I think publishing those just on the Patreon behind a paywall would not be unreasonable. I think uh, it would be very reasonable to have them behind a paywall. And if folks want a uh, more in-depth analysis, a more, a more in-depth contemplation inside of the mind of a corporate cowboy, because... Again, I'm I'm only one person, even if I am relaying the ideas of my associates, even if I am relating them in a manner that is verbal, that is orally told, if I'm orating it to you. But I've got my own purpose. I've got my own purpose. And uh sometimes those sometimes this purpose isn't one hundred percent in line with what my associates want. I mean, that's just the type of circles 
you have to carry. Um, you still have to be a professional. You still have to be able to speak with one another, converse, discuss, debate, argue, and not get completely offended and fucking jump the gun every time. You have to be able to take jokes and make jokes. You have to dish it and... What's the other part? Take it? Dish and take. Because if you can uh, if you can talk shit, you got to be able to... To be the shit. You have to be able to eat shit, pretty much. I think I mentioned before... An older associate of mine... Saying that all badass motherfuckers started out as shit eating grunts. It's a rite of passage. It's a rite of passage. It's not, um, I'm not so much of a, of a dues paid kind of guy, of a paid dues kind of guy, but there are undoubtedly. Um, rites of passage that I do believe everybody has to pay dues in some form or another it's just that sometimes and I've been witness to this occurring with an organization sometimes those dues are are taxed and, and I mean this in the street sense they're jacked they're they're hiked they're spiked individuals who are gatekeeping just for the sake of tripping on a little bit of power will spike the dues on you or have you pay twice or thrice if they think they can put one over on you In my mind, I'm I'm thinking of a title for this one. More than likely, it'll be season finale or some shit. Or gatekeeping. Visit us on Instagram. The page is at... The handle is at incorporating.associates underscore IA. Again, that's at incorporating.associates underscore i a patreon the corporate cowboys podcast subscribe go right ahead i'm not gonna say i'm i'm gonna be super active on there but just know that your support is very much appreciated any funds coming into the organization are going directly towards well, my expenses and legal expenses for the org. All of this uh, will continue to be non-profit, not for profit. Which means any capitalization that does occur is immediately re reinvested. That's essentially what that means. That's capitalism in the purest sense. As soon as you extract from capitalism, the system of capitalism, as soon as you extract the system from, as soon as you extract from the system of capitalism, some amount, any amount, and call it your own profit, you, uh, you make the system unbalanced. You unbalance the system. You make the pie smaller. <laughs> Instead of reinvesting it and enlarging the pie to later eat more pie, you make the pie smaller. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as far as millionaires, billionaires, trillionaires go, they might be good people, right? They might be good people. They're shit capitalists. Some, some of them may or may not ever come across... Um, may not ever meet a corporate cowboy or a corporate cowboy, you know, an aspiring professional may or may not ever get the chance to uh, cross paths with 
a millionaire, a billionaire, a trillionaire. It's getting easier and easier every day. Rest assured, I assure you, it's getting easier and easier. Especially with high-speed communications, the techni- the technological advancements that we've had. It's making connectivity less costly. Less costs have to be incurred to communicate ideas with other people. Not in our social strata. Whereas before, I, I only hung around with street dudes. Um, and again, I was nobody special. I was never a gang member. I, um, I associated with folks from all walks of life. Uh, we were never rich. We never came up. But as time went on, my experience, my knowledge and understanding of the world, the corporate world, developed. I'm able to move from group to group, from level to level. Always putting myself out there. You do have to be outgoing. You do have to take the initiative. Outspoken, not so much. You don't even have to say a whole lot. You just have to know what to say and when. That requires you be an observer first. You observe. You become aware. You read. You gauge what's going on. And how you can best address it. How you can participate. How you can become active. Just want to let y'all know that I've had fun this whole first season. These uh these episodes have I believe been getting better and better. They've allowed me to make a substantial connection with the industry with the profession that I want to get in. <laughs> Whether or not that's motivational speaking, I mean, shit, it could be motivational speaking on a on a one to one. I mean, now it's on a one to zero because it's just me. It's just me. And sure, I'm given the ideas, but finding a way to express those ideas in a way finding <clears throat> finding a manner in which to express those ideas so that they are meaningfully conveyed and that they are received holy that they are wholly received so that there's no misunderstanding well that requires unceasing communication. That requires that communication not stop. I mean, that's the oath I took. That's the fucking, <laughs> that's the vow I took. This project was going to be a life long project. Once you recognize, once you realize what it is to be a corporate cowboy, it's like, I'm sure I've said this before. It's like, it's like learning of your Lord and Savior. It's like having the wool pulled from your eyes and seeing the world again for a second time. <laughs> it's that it's that idea. It's not you doing the double take. It's that idea that makes you look again. It's the notion. It's the instinct that makes you look that second time. That makes you look twice. That has you take a peek first, look away, and think, what the fuck? And look back. <laughs> Not even look back, man. You gotta keep looking forward. A double take could be as simple as a blink. See, that's some corporate cowboy shit. You never wanna really do a double take in corporate. 
you can't be nervous in corporate. You can stare motherfuckers down. I mean, you could stare motherfuckers down and blink and still be staring them down. I mean, I don't I don't get I I I do get you see like the, what this comes from this comes from the street. I do get and understand when somebody is looking at another person and and this person, let's say it's me. Somebody is looking at me and I should choose to check them. The fuck you looking at? <laughs> you know, and they're not posing an immediate threat, but they are looking at me. And I have to question, does the situation warrant their eyeballs on me? And I have to ask myself, am I doing something that is causing me to stand out? Maybe folks around me? My associates? Are they causing some kind of incident that attention is being called on us for. And they can be blinking. They don't have to be giving you that intimidating stare, like staring you down through their fucking eyebrows, that demented look. Folks give themselves in the mirror, trying to look hard, trying to appear hard. Fucking head, head tilted down, eyeballs, eyeballs semi-closed, like a, like a, what is it? It's a, fuck, what is it? It's like a squint. I guess you could call it a squint, right? Looks kind of cute, but, (laughs) I mean, but that's just me, right? When motherfuckers get... When motherfuckers get into a mood, and it could be, again, male or female, and they they think they're hard or, like, it's just where, where they think they're hard, that they believe they must, they must express it through a facial gesture. <laughs> they believe they have to show it through a facial expression. It's funny. I don't know. It's funny to me. It's funny to me. But I, I came up. A clown. I, I came up a little jokester, a little jester. So I'm I am aware of what facial expressions are capable of. It's another form of body language. It's nonverbal. It's easily communicated if you don't have a ski mask on. <laughs> it's easily communicated. And it conveys a lot. In a short amount of time. Over the years, I've learned to train myself in uh, just keeping a straight face. The only time, the the only time really is uh, again when I I need that cathartic release, where I need to employ some enthusiasm, get the blood flowing, get the juices flowing, and the gray areas of my brain I need to evoke some emphasis some emphatic effect and that could be through cursing that could be through gestures through body gestures through through what is it <laughs> through sc- scrunching up scrunching up sneering sneering of the nose i've i've folks i've seen folks um work what is it work the wrinkles on their forehead like that's some kind of fucking and i mean some folks do this naturally like it just happens naturally it's a it's a mode that they've been accustomed to where i don't know something causes them to get to get wrinkles prematurely and um it's something it's not just something it's a habit it's an attribute it's a characteristic what is it i'm gonna go with an attribute it's an attribute that folks can work on to change so that it's not associated with them that's uh but i don't know again that's a that's a person i do know that's a personal it's a personal idea 
and I suppose it goes without saying that I think, um, I think words carry a little further than actions in this case, because I would, I would be a hundred times, not a hundred times, I would, uh, <clears throat> Because I'm not going to quantify something I can't quantify. If I, I can qualify it. See, I'd be more apt to consider a calm, collected, a straight face, straight laced threat than I would somebody who's over the top, boisterous. Just fucking, <laughs> just like, just belligerently threatening. What's that saying? It says, the loudest person in the room is the weakest person in the room. And again, that is dependent on context. Again, I, I might, I might take, and, and, and depending on how loud they are verbally, what what they're wearing if it's loud could also impact and affect an interaction and uh you might be surprised to know that when i was younger i i didn't care what colors i wore i mean now i wear a lot of more neutral tones because i think neutral tones go wear go <clears throat> neutral tones go well with my body type um and the environments that I'm liable to walk into. This is given my profession uh, and given the uh, associations that I keep now. Neutral tones are where it's at. Uh, very little color, if anything, it's just to accent an outfit. And um, I think it keeps me out of folks's attentions um i don't stick around longer than i need to in their memories i'm just i'm just there to make whatever impression i need i'm there to make whatever impression is necessary and uh x fill x exit stage left <laughs> as soon as i'm done but when i was younger maybe like high school college I did wear loud clothes. I mean, nothing ridiculous. And I, I always thought, I think sagging your pants. Just, I mean, baggy clothes is cool. Baggy clothes is all right. I mean, in retrospect, what my high school career looked like, I would have much rather worn baggy clothes than sagging clothes. Like letting my clothes sag because you can still look clean even if you're wearing baggy clothes. You just, again, you just have to know how to interact, how to, how to complete your outfit. You have to wear your clothes, right? Your clothes aren't wearing you. You have to fucking wear your clothes. And some folks might say, well, you know, saggy pants doesn't mean that you're not professional. I think it absolutely does. Because in baggy pants, a professional has to be capable of adapting. Needs to be able to adapt to emergent situations, emergent circumstances, to emergencies, essentially. And if at any point in time, if in... <clears throat> If in an exig if in an exigent circumstance, the need to run should come up. <laughs> you you ain't gonna get far in saggy pants. You're not gonna get far in saggy pants. And again, again, I I just gotta nip it right there in the bud. I mean, you might say I could run faster than you in my saggy pants and. And I've seen folks, yeah, I've seen folks run fast as fuck with saggy pants. 
but they're having to pick them up. They're having to pick them up with one hand or two hands if they're if if, if the shit's fucking excessive. I mean, and again, this all requires that you walk, that you walk with a waddle, with open legs from side to side, so the shit isn't so. So your saggy pants don't drop to the floor. I think it's fucking hilarious. And then when it's time to run, you got to pick up your fucking pants and run. But when you're wearing baggy clothes, I mean, I'm still wearing a belt. I've always worn a belt. I I have gone through times where I, I either tuck my shirt in or not tuck in my shirt. More often than not, if I'm wearing something casual, I might not tuck in my shirt because I've got shit on my waistband. Because I keep that motherfucking thing on me. Um, but if I'm tucking in my shirt, I mean, the shit is professional. I've, I've probably got a holster already. You know, I'm not going to just, I'm not just, I'm not just going to carry it all hot boy status. Might have a holster for it. if, And if it's for immediate use, I mean, it'll be tucked. It's still on my waistband. But you can't do that with sagging pants you can't have shit on your on your belt line and even even if you are the type to wear what basketball shorts or leggings having that under your saggy pants doesn't mean that you'll be able to access them or it'll be effective when it comes time to use them because your hands are going to be busy holding your pants up i've seen it that's why i fucking say it i've seen it i'd much rather wear a belt and have access to my piece when i need it than be stuck holding my fucking pants up Getting shots licked at me. Fuck that. (laughs) Fuck. Fuck that.